In recognition of the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims establishing a colony in Plymouth, Mass., we asked if there were any Holliston residents descended from the people who came over on the Mayflower in 1620. We were pleasantly surprised at how many there are in Holliston and how much they knew about their famous ancestors. Here then are their stories. Carrie, I understand you're related to some people on the Mayflower. Tell us about them. Yes. So, the two people I'd like to talk about today are William Brewster and Peter Brown. Okay. Are there um, any others you're related to? Well, obviously, uh, <laughs> slim pickings back in the day. So, yes, there were some other um, connections I found in my research. So, Peter Brown is also related um, a little further down the line. I found a connection to the Mullins. Uh, so Priscilla and John, Priscilla was a Mullins and she married John Alden. Yep. And so they are very uh, prominent uh, in right. the history, obviously. Yeah. So I found that connection also as I was nice. researching Peter Brown. Great. Yeah. So tell us about Peter. So Peter, um, let's see, what to know about Peter. So he actually came aboard the Mayflower as a... I don't want to say an apprentice, but kind of a friend of William Mullins. So Priscilla Mullins, who married John Alden, right? Her father oh. um, and Peter Brown came together. They suspect there might have been a relationship, some kind of, I don't know if cousin's the right word, okay. or some kind of distant relationship between the two. But anyway, Peter came aboard the ship as a young man, unmarried. I think he was about 25 when he came when he came across and it seems to me that the reason for the Mullins and Peter Brown crew to come aboard the Mayflower was not you know as we've all heard they're separatists right so the religious yeah. faction came across because they were being um, sort of you know uh, well, not they persecuted were, but they were yeah. they were having a tough time but the Mullins and Peter Brown they seem to be part of the group that was known as the strangers Oh. So there are the, you know, the religious folk, the separatists, and then there are also, so the saints, and then there's a group called the strangers. So the strangers actually were not escaping religious persecution. Right. Um, I suspect, and a lot of people do suspect, that they came more for entrepreneurial purposes. Really? Yeah. Um, Mullins was a shoemaker, and Peter was obviously a young man that, they needed to help build the colonies. Um, and I think he came aboard, he actually came from a line of weavers. Right. So his father was a weaver, so he knew that art. And he set that up when he arrived here. That he was his did. business. He did. So, right. um, like I said, so they're part of the strangers yeah. that, the, that they call. So not necessarily religious, escaping religious persecution per se for those folks. Um, Brewster, obviously, yeah. very different. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, there's an interesting story about Peter, one of the, right that first winter when he went out looking for thatch. So that thatch. First, first winter, obviously, everybody knows, was very difficult. He did yeah. survive that first winter, but uh, there was that story where he and another young guy, sort of the same age and stature, they kind of went off into the woods looking for the thatch for the houses for uh, the plantation and I think he had a dog with him and I think the story yeah, goes that the, two. that the dog or the dogs either got spooked or they saw something in the woods and they took off into the woods and the men went off after them and sort of got lost <laughs> <laughs> and ended up having to spend the night in the woods so as you can imagine that had to be kind of scary in a territory that they, they were unfamiliar with um, and they obviously came upon some animals that <laughs> they were unfamiliar with. Also, I think the, the lore has it that they thought they were lions, yeah, that's but right, that right. Um, turns out to probably be coyotes or wolves or something of the sort. Raccoon. Or raccoon, ah. <laughs> something that spooked them uh, up into a tree. So that's where they spent the night. Yeah, um, imagine that. Was <laughs> in a tree. So... Um, I guess when the morning light came, they were actually able to then see where they were in relation to the plantation wow. and were able to navigate yeah. their way back home. So they survived, um, but they did have a pretty exciting story to tell. Right. <laughs> yeah. And what about William Brewster? Oh, Brewster. I see him as like the main character in a, in a 
action movie because of all of the all of the things that he actually went through. He was considered an elder by the time he came across. You know, he was an older man, so he had lived basically an entire life in England. Actually, was postmaster, um, yep. following in his father's footsteps for seventeen years. Um, so he had an entire life before he sort of joined this separatist movement. He was actually one of the only um, people on board the Mayflower that had any kind of college education yeah. um, at Cambridge University. So he was sort of, I think, introduced to separatist ideas there. Yeah, and, and that he sort really of got into it. Blossoms and, over time. And that church he was with sort of mm -hmm. sent him over as their founding yeah. father in the yeah. new world. Well. I mean, he had gone through a, a lot before he even got on the Mayflower. Yeah. Um, they, had, they had gone to the Netherlands to find a more friendly society yeah. towards them because clearly in, in England it was not um, uh, going popular, yeah. very well. So he, they escaped, um, and I say escaped because they were not really allowed to leave England on their own free will without permission. So wow. they were kind of under cloak of night, you know, sort of moved to the Netherlands. Um, he actually started up a printing press and printed a bunch of the, the publications Separatist, that were yeah. illegal in England. So he had this whole underground operation where he was trying to get, you know, word out of this movement. Um, and he was caught and I think his printing press partner was arrested. He escaped somehow and like, like I said, it's like this whole action movie. Escapes, got back to England and then um, they got granted land. I don't know exactly how, but they got granted land and he got, he and a few other friends got on board the Mayflower and were able to, yeah. to get to uh, the Americas. It's also interesting um, how he named his kids and the strange names that they had, especially the one right. I thought was most interesting was wrestling. Wrestling, yeah. So love and wrestling were the two boys that came with him aboard the Mayflower. He also had two daughters. Um, Patience was born in England. Um, and Fear, yeah. also born in England, but did not come on the Mayflower. They came on a later boat. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and do you know the, the meaning behind the name wrestling? Wrestling. Wrestling, yeah. Why he named one of them wrestling? Why did he name him wrestling? It was, according to what I read, it was from, um, they took the, the word from Genesis 32, mm -hmm. where Jacob is quoted as wrestling with an angel. And oh, so. It goes on to say that it, it taught him humility, so it sort of implies that the name wrestling meant humility. So that's what he wanted to instill in this son that he named wrestling. Wrestling. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, very. But I get the separatists were all noted for strange names for their kids for some reason. Right, it was part of, well, yeah. Patience is who I was oh, yeah. descendant from. <laughs> yeah, oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, that's cool. So when did you first find out about your link with uh, the Mayflower? So it's an interesting story. I grew up in Ohio. Um, and growing up there, the only person of any fame that I ever heard of being related to was Alexander Hamilton. Oh. So every time my grandmother or my mother would give me a $10 bill, they would point to Alexander Hamilton and say, he's your uncle. And oh, I'm no, like, okay. you know, when I'm 10, I'm like, what does that even mean? He's right. like, just give me plenty of that. Yeah, <laughs> just give me more. So that sort of sparked um, a little curiosity in me when I had my first child. I was like, well, okay, how exactly are we related to this guy? So I started my ancestry then. My oh membership in Ancestry.com to kind of figure out that connection. Because um, try as my grandmother might, she couldn't line up the Philip Schuylers that we were connected to. So oh. uh, she had written letters. And anyway, so it was part of, that was my initial push to discover, you know, where my family came from. So being from Ohio, um, I really didn't think much of any Massachusetts connections, obviously, um, until there was one. My first inclination that I had any connections in Massachusetts was I was driving around in Sudbury and I saw my grandmother's maiden name as a street sign. Oh. <laughs> Blackmer Road, somewhere in that town. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting, but there's no way that there's any connection. Um, and I sort of schluffed it off and didn't think anything about it until quarantine hit. And uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. Oh. <laughs> So it's just been recently that it's you've done all this research? It's been recently. I mean, my family did not really know much about 
any of these connections going beyond like what I said, the yeah. Alexander Hamilton. So you really got into it. I can tell from I what did. you said so far. I did. I really yeah. just, it was like a rabbit hole. I couldn't How about I couldn't the kids? Stop. Are they interested at all? Well, they love, obviously with the musical Hamilton, they love bragging about being, <laughs> being related to, yeah. um, to Alexander Hamilton. They know that. Um, I'm trying to explain to them different aspects of who we're related to. And it's kind of fun. We did a little vacation on the Cape um, for a week in August, and there were a lot of names I kept recognizing as I was, you know, oh, driving wow. around, like Prince, and I'm like, we're related to him, you know, and like we would see the, actually the cottage we rented was on Snow Lane, and I just discovered, I mean, my whole line is of snow. Really? All the way back to almost the Mayflower, yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> who knew that, you So, know. do you continue to do research? Are you oh, yeah. always There's, interested in history now? There are so many rocks to, to uncover, and I keep discovering more. Like I said, I just, in preparation for this interview, I discovered that the, the Alden yeah. uh, connection as well, which wow. was... Very interesting, and I'm joining um, different Facebook groups. So there's an Alden Descendants Facebook group, and there's the Mayflower Descendants, just general Facebook group. So it's interesting, kind of connecting with those people and discovering cousins that are yeah, and like with this whole thing, discovering cousins wow. that are here in Holliston. And then now that um, um, you know all of this, once the pandemic is over, you may make a trip to Plymouth. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we we all we actually um, went up to Salem. Wow. Uh, recently too, and I also have a Salem witch trial connection, so that has been fun, <laughs> of course, um, with that. But Alden actually actually has a son that was also accused oh, really? in the Salem witch trials. Oh wow! Yeah. I hadn't heard John that. Alden, Captain John Alden Jr., was accused in the witch trials also. So he's an uncle of mine. I was descendant from Joseph, yeah. but John was accused. Oh, I take it he wasn't convicted. He was. He survived. Oh. He survived because wow. he well, he was a powerful man. You know, clearly yeah. had some clout, um, so he was able to survive. My grandmother, wow. on the other hand, well, we've had was um, a couple of uh, residents who say they're related to the, the witch trials. Right. Um, not maybe surprising. we'll have to do a show on that. Just on that, that. would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah would be fun. Especially. Yeah. It's very. Wow. Very timely, actually, with. Yeah. Everything. Well, this has been great. I want to thank you for taking your time. It was. You awesome certainly to taught have us you. a lot. It's great to have you here in Holliston. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. I'm excited to talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. This is Melissa Ford from the Holliston Historical Society. It's a beautiful Friday morning and we are in Mudville and we are talking to Bobby Blair, AKA the mayor of Mudville, about his descendants from the Mayflower. It's a wonderful morning. Bob, glad that you joined us today. Thank Thanks you. for the information and the help. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the descendants that you found, which is really interesting, that you are related to. Well, the funny thing is, uh, we only found these during the last five or six years. Um, I'm half Irish, quarter Scot, and this is the rest of it. <laughs> and what we found out is we're related to William Bradford, Miles Standish, William Mullins, Priscilla Mullins, John Alden, and George Sewell. A very illustrious history, actually. That is amazing. And just, that's only one branch that you found out, correct? Well, uh, the, once you get back there, it's interesting. They say if you get back to someone like John Alden, my ninth great-great-great-great-grandfather, <laughs> uh, you may have others, uh, which in this case I do. And they say when you get back that far uh, to ninth and tenth generations, you can have 49,000 plus great, 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 great uh, Amazing. relatives. So, I, I always used to love the story of Miles Standish and John Alden and Priscilla, and one of them, you know, asking his friend to go and talk with her and convince her that you know he was enamored of her, and the other guy won, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, John Alden married Priscilla Mullins. Uh, who came over with her mother, father, and brother, and all three of those uh, died in the first year at uh, Plymouth. Wow. And she went on to marry John Alden, um, and they actually had a daughter, Ruth, uh, who married John Bass, 
and their daughter Hannah married Joseph Adams and their son John was the second president of the United States and their son uh, John Quincy Adams was the sixth <laughs> president Amazing. which we didn't know this before and all of a sudden wow uh, that's interesting and your brother is the one that started you on this road? Of, well, of he started up? doing it. I had seen the name um, Sewell in the uh, family genealogy, but well, I thought it was French. I didn't know. I had no <laughs> idea. Uh, I would have thought that by the spelling also. I agree. I right. Well, when you get back there and look at all these, uh, a lot of these names are spelled differently. Mm -hmm. uh, William Bradford, uh, and you can go on Wikitree and follow uh, Bradford's line right back to, uh, they don't give a first name, but it would be like his great, 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 great grandfather to 1435. Wow. Which is amazing to, well, we all obviously all had relatives back then, but to actually be able to name them is uh, interesting. It really is. you know. I, I, it's just amazing the whole history of the Mayflower and 200 people crammed on that teeny little boat because we've been there and 100 died the first year. 100 died. Which must have been a horrendous winter. I mean, it must have been a horrendous time for them. You know, having to set up complete living quarters and hunting and using whatever skills they had when they came here. It's just amazing, you know, the amount of stamina and strength and fortitude those people had. You know, these, it's like we're proud to be related to them. It's, it's awesome. When, does it, you probably have always had an interest in history. So I have. So this piqued my interest uh, and my brother in doing the genealogy. It was uh, a relative of mine, Daniel Stimson, uh, which was my grandmother's maiden name. Wow. Actually married Sarah Sewell. So that's what led us back to George Sewell, who came on the Mayflower uh, 10 generations ago. And he was a servant to Edward Winslow. And, you know, to read the history of these people, uh, William Bradford, which would be a great, great, great grandfather, amazing. Just amazing. Uh, was actually the second governor of Plymouth. Uh, an office he served in for 30 years. Wow. Uh, and I believe he and Miles Standish and another great, 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 uh, they set up the town of Duxbury, which was uh, right next door. See, I don't think I ever knew that. I, I always associate Standish with Plymouth because of the Miles Standish Park that's down there. And then Bradford, you know, a lot of things that are named after Governor Bradford. Um, in that area, so that that's really interesting to know that I know they're right next to each other, but it's awesome that you know that that connection is there. Right. It's just, oh, well, you make so many connections here yeah. that Daniel Stimson, uh, who married Sarah Sewell, let us off, and we're related to Henry Stimson, who was the Secretary of War under six presidents. Amazing. Something we didn't know before. Right. That's amazing. Six presidents. Six and, pri and from, when were the presidents from uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Taft uh, through Roosevelt. Wow! Uh, and so Truman during the wars, in there. one World War One and two, right? Right. Wow, that's amazing. Secretary of War must have been a huge position too. Wow, it's just uh, it's just awesome. All this this history, I love it. Um, were they, obviously they were very important in settling America because we know their names to this day. But I wonder what some of the other people did when they first came here, what their skills were, what their craft was. You know, were they carpenters? Were they shoemakers? Were they... Well, as I mentioned, uh, Miles Standish came as the ship's military officer. Wow. And uh, John Alden actually was not a passenger, but a crew member. Oh. And he decided that. to stay. Wow. Uh, and sure a lot of these easier than going back. <laughs> yeah, a lot of these people were young. 
I mean, oh, yeah. 19, 20 years old, uh, a lot of them were coming for religious uh, reasons, probably the older ones, but someone like John Alden said, hey, here's a job uh, floating on a boat off to who knows where. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Um, Amazing. It really is. Now, you, you mentioned earlier that um, the Mayflower came from Holland and England. I don't think I ever knew that either. Well, no, I think some of the people uh, came from Holland to England and the, Got uh, the boat Mayflower there. sailed from England. I think it, uh, I don't know if it was coming with another boat that turned around and whatnot. Hmm. Was there ever a list established of all the people who arrived on the Mayflower? Oh, yeah. There is a master list? Uh -huh. And then those people that perished in the first year. Uh, half of the half of the passengers. Amazing. I'd like to know how they assimilated themselves and talked with the Indians who were here and sort of you know well, they always... you know and that's a sad uh, part of the chapter uh, you know yeah. uh, the next uh, colony in Massachusetts uh, was in Weymouth uh, and actually they had uh, caught an Indian stealing, so they put him to death. Uh, and then the Indians made a raid because they caught one of the Plymouth uh, Plantation uh, colonists stealing from them. Oh, wow. Uh, well, I think that um, you will find shortly that you will have some relatives in common with um, Mr. Conley, who was also going to be part of this interview process. And it'll be interesting to see how many of the descendants that you get to meet at some point you are related to, which is I think is awesome. Well, Conley being an Irish name, I've decided for Thanksgiving <laughs> to have corned beef and cabbage, uh, <laughs> maybe haggis for the Scots, Ooh. and and turkey uh, for my <laughs> descendants Mayflower on descendants. The Mayflower. That's, that sounds like a great buffet to me. <laughs> That's awesome. I really appreciate all this time and, and energy and effort and. Certainly, the interest and information you've given us, it, it's really awesome to, to hear all this. And it, it's so, I love history, and I love this kind of, of information to, to hear about the people who started our country and who came here with nothing except the clothes on their back and a hope. It's awesome. When we had found out, we kidded my father and said, some of your relatives only got, uh, you know, 25 or 30 miles from Plymouth, at least Mars came all the way over from <laughs> Ireland. Right. So. right. It's awesome. It's great. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Appreciate that a lot. So we're here with Dan Brady. Thank you for taking the time to tell us about your ancestors who came over on the Mayflower. Great to talk with you. Thank you. So who is your, who are your ancestors? Sure. So uh, the ones that are relevant to this discussion, uh, I found this out basically by well, sort of by accident, unexpectedly. Uh, there are very famous ancestors, John Alden and Priscilla Mullins, uh, that, wow. were, that were stars of uh, Longfellow's uh, courtship of mild uh, Standish epic yeah. poem. Yeah. And Longfellow himself was an ancestor on a different, uh, uh, on, it was a descendant on a different branch, actually, of, oh. of, the, of these same people, interestingly enough. Um, and so in the, in the colony, uh, it, was, it was mainly either, well, they had some families and they had some un, unaccompanied males. Not a lot of unaccompanied marriageable age women. Right. So uh, I think she was pretty much, um, Priscilla Mullins was pretty much the only one at the time. So, so very sought after. Uh, <laughs> and de definitely Miles Standish had an interest, uh, but she ended up with John Alden and it became one of America's uh, most famous romances, I guess. I guess that well, that's maybe the second one after John Smith and Pocahontas. So it's yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, our, yeah, right. a local version okay, of that, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, when did you find out that you were related? Yeah. So it, I had I'd, like a lot of people have done the ancestry DNA test, and then they, they have an ancestry.com. There's two different things: there's genealogy and the genetics, and they actually marry them. They actually cross over, which gives you interesting things that you may not know about, uh, you know, and 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 can link link through to some. Uh, hard to uh, hard to reach gene uh, genealogical information. Okay, so yeah. so basically, they have something called through lines where you can look at people who are related to you genetically and how that crosses over with your genealogical tree. It's a little bit little bit obscure, but and so I didn't know that I even had any uh, Mayflower ancestors. We always I basically grew up you know I, 
thinking I was Irish Catholic, and some maybe some Scottish ancestors. Okay, so your parents didn't know either. No, they wouldn't. They would. That was the last thing they they, they identify with. Uh, like say, my <laughs> my my mother has a, has a mother who came right from Ireland. She was a maid for many uh, Boston Brahmin families, and she she would have had a chuckle that her husband was a Mayflower ancestor. So your connection is on your. My, well, this is on my uh, mother's side. My mother's father side. has some. Puritan ancestors in uh, from Nova Scotia as well, so okay. that's where it comes in. In Nova Scotia, there was sort of that mix of the early settlers who were uh, the Yankees, uh, a lot of whom were um, Tories, yep. uh, or they got free land to go up there from okay. the British or whatever. And then um, then a lot of Scots, obviously Nova Scotia, uh, both Highland and Lowland, and then uh, then Irish Catholics as well. You yeah. know, all kind of mixed okay. together. So, you know, so when you found out about it, did uh did it spare your interest in the whole Mayflower Pilgrim thing? Did you go to? Uh, uh, well, I've already bad been to Plymouth. I've always been interested in history. It's always been, um, you know, one of my um, okay, big, good. Big, yeah. big subjects, you know. Um, and did so it, 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 you didn't need that to pique your interest in no, no, in, any, but, but it did come as a surprise. Uh, so I started to find out that you know there were there were these lines on both sides that. That went back to the Puritans, even though we say we're primarily Irish and Scottish, but there are some lines that go through Nova Scotia and then back to uh, New England. You know, uh, and then in this case, it was uh, it was uh, you know there were Mayflower ancestors, very famous ones. And in addition to the couple, they had the first um, child born in the colony, Elizabeth Alden, and then she moved later on to Little Compton, Rhode Island, where she lived. Yeah, and I think there's still a monument to her there. Okay. Yep. So that's interesting. Did um, have, you, have you passed this interest on to your daughter? Uh, yes, so she was very interested in it, and she's kind of like uh, you know up on current issues. And she was saying, well, you know, we should be more conscious of what happened to the Native Americans because of you know we have this ancestry. So she got, kind of was remind. And then I, we, I kind of we kind of looked at some things that were online about kind of stereotypes about the Pilgrims and the Indians and okay. you know, it's sort of funny but sort of not funny when you look at some of those things. So. Yeah well that's good so she has an interest in it as well so yeah. you're keeping that interest Absolutely. alive. Absolutely and we that part of the reason for even doing the ancestry we thought my mother always thought you know she maybe had like uh, Indian ancestors in, in Nova Scotia but that hasn't come up in the in the in the in the DNA part but there may have some indications there may be but it's a probably a small percentage if, if it is it's the case you know. Okay and so now that you know did you then pass the word back to your parents. So that they yeah, 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 yeah. They, 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 they still, you know, consider themselves Irish, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, they, they got a little chuckle, chuckle out of that. Okay. Um, but Great. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Well, I'm glad that uh, you guys are keeping it alive. Yeah. And you, you, you have the interest, which Absolutely, is great. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk oh, to yeah, us. Oh yeah, great. So here with Deb Moore today. Deb, thanks for being with us. This is an exciting project. Here we have going with the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower landing at Plymouth. Um, so you have an interesting story. Um, I understand you have a notorious passenger that was on the Mayflower. Could you tell us about uh, that person? Sure, that was my 10th great-grandfather, John Billington. And um, like you said, he came over on the Mayflower. He was born um, over in England and he was born into poverty and he was looking for a new life that he was kind of promised um, coming to the new world. So him, his wife, Elena, and his two sons, John Jr. and Francis, um, boarded ship and came over here. But when they got here, they, the people that he came with thought that he, they were a little raucous family, some troublemaking, um, maybe even called dysfunctional. And the first incident that happened when they arrived, before they even got off the Mayflower, was his son Francis got a hold of his musket and fired it off inside the Mayflower near an open um, barrel of gunpowder and almost set the ship on fire and people would have uh, perished. But luckily that didn't happen, but people were very upset with his behavior and it kind of set the stage for what was to follow um, with the entire family. Um, later on, a couple months later, um, there was a lot of um, pushback from John Billington. He was, as I said before, a rabble rouser. He um, didn't like authority, didn't like, he was anti-government. So he got involved in some of the um, things that were going on and he made speeches about the captain of the ship 
and that landed him um, a trial and he was found guilty and they were going to tie him hands and feet and humiliate him but he begged forgiveness and because it was his first offense they let it go and they forgave him. Mm -hmm. um, a couple more things that happened was um, their son John he decided to go off um, exploring on his own and he was gone for five days he ended up on Cape Cod he was found by the Indians <clears throat> they brought him back and this was one of the first encounters that the pilgrims had with the Indians so the pilgrims were not very happy with his behavior as well so there were a few things that happened that kind of set the stage for um, the troublemaker um, anti-government type of uh, persona that mm -hmm. the family had. So a real rebel, rebel rouser, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, when did you find out about the connection? Well, it was a couple years ago. <clears throat> I've been um, searching um, my family tree, and I have about a thousand um, known descendants on it right now. And, um, you know, I came, I came across him, so I was really interested because of his infamous background and it was kind of disturbing to me because um, never did I know that anyone in my family had ever committed you know a crime been in jail or or anything to that and um, I had to kind of pause for a few days to kind of digest the whole thing and I kept doing more more research on it and um, there's a different spin on him also out there which is that, um, as I had mentioned, besides being a rabble rouser, he was very much for freedom of speech and he was anti-government. And I think that um, made him a target of uh, William Bradford. And um, he had this ongoing feud with one of the other pilgrims. And they happened to be out in the woods at the same time. And he came back and the other pilgrim didn't. So the other pilgrim had been shot and died. So they attributed that to him. And Bradford was the judge and um, he sentenced him. And in many of Bradford's writings, um, he clearly states his disdain for Billington even before this event. And um, they, they feel that he had a prejudice to him and he didn't really get a fair trial. So now I've found out that some of his descendants um, have actually petitioned um, Governor Baker, Charlie Baker, to lighten his um, sentence or say that he really didn't receive a fair trial and it wasn't really outright murder, like first degree murder. And so they've been working on that for a couple of years. So I thought that was an, an interesting spin on sure. things and it makes me feel not that you ever feel comfortable with that, but maybe he really didn't commit the crime that he was accused of. Mm -hmm. okay. Has all this piqued your interest in American history? Um, it does. I always had um, a fondness for American history, and this has just made it grow, but it's also growing into um, even what happened before the pilgrims came here into European history. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there's just so much out there to learn. Mm -hmm. In fact, I just started um, taking this week a genealogy course at Boston University um, to become a certified genealogist. Oh, great. So um, it, it's been good. It's only the first week. I have quite a few more weeks to go, but mm -hmm. um, it's something that has really piqued my interest. Oh, that's great. great, okay. Have your ancestors, have they been key players in settling America, do you feel? Um, yes, I, I feel they have. Um, besides, you know, Billington, we go out from there, and a lot of my relatives on both sides of the family came from England and um, did a lot to settle Cape Cod and the South Coast in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So in this area, they're, um, you know, well known in history. Has there been any positive things that have happened in your family? Well, um, one of his two sons, Francis Billington, is credited with really saving the pilgrims in their second winter, because as you know, the first winter, half of them uh, passed on because of the conditions. And um, it just so happened that he was a little bit adventurous like his brother, 
and he took a walk up Fort Hill, climbed up a tree, and saw this huge expanse of water, which they thought was the Pacific Ocean, but it ended up being a five-mile lake in Plymouth. And um, it happened that there were a lot of fish, a lot of ve vegetation, a lot of animals in the area. And that was what really got them through their second winter. So he's credited with really saving the colony um, and not having it decimated completely. So that was something very positive that happened. His curiosity really ended up being a, a positive event. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, have you passed all of this history down to your son? Well. My son ended up being a history major in college, so I guess there's some of that, but his um, part of history that he loves the most is actually Roman history and the Roman Empire. And he is actually a Latin, high, sc high school Latin teacher in um, Wilmington, Delaware, in an all-boys um, Catholic high school, and he just loves that. So he wasn't really interested in the beginning, when I first started, you know, researching, because it was like going back <clears throat> two or three generations, and he's not really that interested in American history. But when I started getting back into the 1400s over in Europe, he goes, now you're talking, Mom. Now I'm interested. Yeah. Okay. Right. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, I just, you know, hope that um, the group of descendants are successful um, with their mission of trying to bring out more of the truth of what happened to John Billington and to leave people with the idea that he was really um, an advocate for freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Kevin. Paul. Thanks for joining us and sharing your Mayflower history with uh, residents of Holliston. I see from the list you sent me that um, it's quite long some very famous ones, not so famous ones. Can you try to remember half a dozen for us? Can I use my cheat sheet? Okay, sure. Ones I, the ones I've known I'm related to, William Bradford, William Elder Brewster III, Mary Love Wentworth, Stephen Hopkins, John Alden, Priscilla Sarah Mullins, that's through a squiggly line. All right. Constance Hopkins, William Mullins, Alice Atwood Portiers, John Howland, I think she was married to somebody. So. Wow. And then Elizabeth Tilly, Thomas Rogers, Dorothy May, Degory Priest, Isaac Allerton, Mary Norris, Demarius Hopkins, Elizabeth Fisher, <laughs> Joseph Rogers, Joan Hurst, John Tilly, and Francis Cook. Wow, that's a lot. Yes. And some of those are pretty famous. Yes. Uh, Hopkins. Stephen Hopkins, right? Very much so. He was just the subject of a recent show that HCAT put on called Stefano. He was, um, he was actually in the, came to the New World before the Mayflower, right? He was heading towards Jamestown and missed. Yeah, got blown, uh, blown out of line and went to uh, Bermuda. Bermuda. Yeah, interesting show. Yeah. Uh, there's a good documentary. I hope everybody will watch it. Yeah, um, he was and I see the that three of them died that very first winter. They did. I think one lady who was a relative fell off in Provincetown before they got to Plymouth, and she drowned. That might have been that Dorothy May. Yes, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, her husband remarried. And then, uh, was it Rogers? Yeah. I believe the father. Okay. Died the first winter. Yes, Tom Rogers and also His Daguerre Pri uh, Priest. Yeah. Jewelry priest and his yeah. Roger's son stayed on and yeah. lived a long life down well, the It's interesting that you're still related to them and, and a lot more. So yeah. when did you first find out about your link with the Mayflower? Well, maybe about 20, 22 years ago, I started doing genealogy and I went down the rabbit hole and my grandmother is three quarters English and she's an old blue blood of Boston. And were, you, once, were you expecting to find a link to, to the Mayflower or not? I, not then, okay. it was very much surprising. But once I realized and do genealogy, if you got an old blue blood in your family tree, you're linked to everybody. Yeah. You may not know it, but you're linked to everybody. And the Mayflower might have mega millions of descendants around the world who just don't know they're related. Right, yeah, we're starting to see that. Yeah. And, and so what did it mean to you when you found out it was, you were related to the Mayflower? That piqued your interest in history? Oh, very much so. I, I, I love following the history. 
And I think one of the key documents was my uh, family, family burial record in Everett was done by Tamsin Twining Snow. Ah, and that's twining. a big link yeah. into Plymouth, Cape Cod, and the whole thing. And, and she's, in fact, she's buried over in the, in the Everett Woodlawn Cemetery. Okay. And I think that's what really got the interest going. That's why I made the connection. Have you, have you passed on this interest to your kids? I've tried to. Yeah. I have so many records online through the ancestry tree, they can find it. I have pictures, I have profiles, I have reports on them, it's, it's a lot. Did, uh, did you find out any, anything interesting about any of them other than um, Hopkins? Well, there were, were any of them like uh, big politicians eventually? Well, Bradford, Governor Bradford. Yeah, so he became governor. Yeah, well, you look at uh, Stephen Hopkins, he was an interesting guy, he was going to Jamestown, and got waylaid to Bermuda to the Isle of Devils, had to talk his way out of there with some emotion to get out of there, to get back up to uh, uh, Plymouth eventually. Right. And then it was a very religious group that they were very, they wanted religious freedom, but they still imposed their religious freedoms once they, once they got here. And there was no alcohol consuming, no games, no fun on Sundays. But he got caught having a bar, serving alcohol and playing games from money on Sundays, and so he was a bit of a rogue back in the 1630s. Yeah, yeah, and he was convicted of mutiny, but I don't think it was his fault. The ship got blown out, blown out, With, of yeah. course, yeah, so that's cool. That was fascinating. Uh, he also became the interpreter with the, or the person who contacted the Indians in Plymouth, and he had Samoset, one of the Indian chiefs, I believe, yep. stay at his house overnight uh. in Plymouth. So. Did there he do wasn't, any fire water, do you know? Or? He probably drank some. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. And then uh, Isaac Allerton was a, was it, and he was an interesting, he became like the deal maker for the pilgrims. He'd make deals with different groups, the Indians. Indians. And he probably took advantage of it to his own personal benefit. Yeah, yeah. Which he probably shouldn't have done. And uh, he did business ventures that were not authorized by the pilgrims or by the people in Plymouth. Oh, really? Yeah, he was a bit um, of a rogue. And you, uh, you actually were uh, interested in the Mayflower even before you did the genealogy because uh, <laughs> you were in a play, weren't you, in, in school? Yeah, back in 1964. How old were you then? Uh, eight. 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 I was eight years old. So that's like, what, third grade? Yeah, like third grade. Yeah. And we, uh, we did a play. The, were the, through the Cub Scouts. Oh. The Den Mothers got their kids to be Indians. Everybody else had to be a pilgrim or a pilgrim woman. And my brother had to be a pilgrim woman. He cried the whole time. He was a year older than me. He didn't like to do that. And you weren't a, you weren't a woman in the play? They asked me to, I said, no. I'll be an Indian, and that's it. Fine, you can be an Indian. I was kind of a stubborn kid. And we actually have a picture of that. Yes. A group picture. Yes. Yeah. And that was fun. Was it a, did you guys uh, replay the, the first Thanksgiving dinner? Was we that did. the idea? At the Harrington, High, Harrington School in, in Lexington, huh. up on the stage, huh. we, we did the play, the Cub Scouts were doing plays, and that was our skit. Yeah, yeah. Was the, okay, cool. It was the first dinner yeah. at Plymouth, and that was neat. Uh, we did that. Okay. Any, anything else you want to tell us that we haven't covered? Um, no, but in, in, the, in the bigger respect, my grandmother was three quarters English. Okay. And Again, you can tie into everything, uh, into Boston. The, uh, you can tie into the Lexington Common if you want to. You can tie into Paul Revere. You can tie into the Salem Witch Trials on both sides. Wow. Yeah, and you're related to all of those? Yeah, you really can't pick a side because you're on yeah. both. And you also listed in, in your uh, uh, documents that um, you're related to somebody who was killed in the King Philip's War. That was... Joseph Rogers. Oh, Joseph Rogers, yes. Amazing. Yes. And do you know where he was? Was he in Medfield or? Over there somewhere. I'm not exactly quite sure. Back towards Boston. But, well, back towards Medfield. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah. he was out this way? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah because that, that Indian, that Native American, uh, killed a lot of uh, settlers. Oh, yeah. Before they finally got him. Yeah. It was so this has been great. Thank you very much for taking oh, the time. Oh, I have one last yeah? story. Okay. Ever hear of the Plymouth Rock? Yeah. You know there's a big gate around it? Sure. You know why? 
No. Because back in 1930, my mother took a piece of the Plymouth Rock out. The kids used to go down there. She might have been 10. They chipped a rock, piece of rock out. Really? Took it home with them. And after that, they put the big protector around. Who has that rock. piece now? Do you know? No, I don't. Hopefully I not you. I, I, wouldn't, I would not dare take that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks again for taking the time to talk to us. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. So, Bill, the drowns are related to a lot of people in history, and we'll get to them later, but first we'd like to talk about your ancestors on the Mayflower. Who were you related to? There were three families that I was related to on the Mayflower. One was John Tilly and his wife. One was William White and his wife, and also John Alden. Okay, well, a lot of people know about John Alden. He was pretty famous, but the Tillys, not so much. What do you know about them? They came over from England. They were part of uh, the, the people that were from Holland, Leyland, Holland, and they came over here for a better life for themselves and for freedom of religion and, and so forth. And they also came over here uh, for a better life for their family and for their children. Okay, so they were known as the planters as opposed to the adventurers. Um, how did the Tillys uh, make out? Did they live long? No, when they came over here, um, they both passed away in the first winter in 1621. Uh, they had a daughter and she survived. Um, and she married uh, subsequently down the road and, and uh, raised a family and had many children. Wow, and the Whites, what about them? The Whites also died that very first winter. Mm. Um, they had a son, Peregrine, that was actually born on the Mayflower while it was in harbor here in the States. Uh, he was the first child born in the, new, oh, wow. in the new world at that time. That's interesting. Yes. Yes, there's also, they had another brother called Resolve, some of the names back then were a little bit different than they are today. Yeah, and I understand both of them uh, were signers of the Mayflower Compact? Yes, they were. So, um, I haven't read a whole lot about it, but I wonder how many people actually signed the compact? Was that just reserved for the elders, or how did that yes, work? Yes, I believe there, there was no one that was like under age 21 that would sign it. They had to be over 21 years old. Okay. Um, and that compact was done at the very end of 1620 shortly after they got here. Um, and it was a pact to basically keep the families together as one unit to stay together and it was all for one. And this is, you know, they wanted to make okay. sure that they were both all going in the same direction at the same time. Okay. And tell us, how did you, uh, when did you first become aware of your connection with history? How did that come about? Well, my family going back, my grandfather who I knew um, they were very proud of their, their heritage and the drowned name. Um, and there was a, a relative or an uncle who, uh, Shem Drown, who made the grasshopper weather vane on Faneuil Hall, amongst others. Wow, yeah, that's pretty famous. And they went back, and there, it goes back, uh, way back to the Mayflower days. But my grandfather was a historian, and he liked that sort of stuff, and my dad was too. And they, were both very, very proud uh, with their connection to the early Americans and the early American history. And they were basically Massachusetts and Rhode Island people. Uh -huh. uh, the little Compton, Rhode Island, where my, my grandfather had a home, as well as in Newton, Mass. And my dad grew up in Newton, Mass. And, and did you find this interesting as a child? Yes, I found it very interesting. And it, it uh, made me feel sort of connected to ancient history or ancient okay. American history. Yeah. Um, so did you do a lot of following up on your own? I have over the years yeah. and different people. I have a sister-in-law who's very much into genealogy and she did a lot of research on it. My aunt did a lot of research on it. My, my father's sister um, following the drowned name going way yeah. back. And besides the drowned name, there's, there's a lot of other famous names in your history. Yes, uh, I'm related to the Simmons family. Uh, Moses Simmons came over to this country on the Fortune, which came over in 1621, the year after the Mayflower. Yeah. And when you follow his family line down, one of his son, sons, John Simmons, was the founder of Simmons College. Oh, wow. um, John is a very interesting man and a very wealthy man. Uh, John was the, as a young child, came to Boston from Maine and worked with his brother in the clothing business. And he had the idea of making clothing 
of a common size on speculation. Hmm. Back in the old days, clothing was all custom made. People were fitted and the uh, tailors would make the clothes for them. If you had the money. If you had the money, but no one just made clothes on speculation. Really? So he thought this would be a good way to go. He started, built up this company. He sent salesmen out to New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio and so forth to drum you up. You remember the early years? Drum up is, this was, a, this was pre-Civil War. This is like in the 1830s, okay. 1835. Uh -huh. um, and he built up this uh, huge clothing business. Um, they occupied the whole second floor of the Quincy Market in Boston. Uh -huh. um, at one time, he uh, supposedly employed over 28,000 people in Massachusetts. In various shops. Uh, in various shops, and what happened, what he would do is the, would, they would cut the patterns at the, at the factory or this place of business in Boston, send them out to women, wives, out in the, in the uh, town, surrounding towns. They would sew them, in send them back. In their own homes kind of thing? In their or? own homes, yeah. send them back. Uh -huh. They'd press them, and then they'd send them out and sell them. Uh -huh. um, and he is the founder of Simmons College, which he wanted to set up a school for women. It was Simmons College for Women when it started yeah. out uh, to give them a way, a place to get a liberal arts degree and to be able to better themselves so they could get out into the the world, per se, instead of being at-home moms, that they would be able to get out and, and have that jobs. That was later in the 1800s? The college was, was actually, the money was put aside and was supposed to start in 1875. They were supposed to start the building of it, but there was a big fire in Boston, the Great Fire of 1872. And John lost a lot of his properties. He had a, a great many buildings down in the financial district, oh. which he lost, but he had money set aside in trust. They were able to rebuild them. And they actually opened the college in 1899. Wow. Um, and that's been going on ever since. It's been going on ever Imagine since. Imagine it wasn't too popular at the time, asking to educate women. No. Uh, they wanted them, the men wanted them at home. That's right. And they, uh, one of the articles I read there was they graduated the first black lady in 1914, graduated from the school. No kidding. Wow, and you've got some memorabilia on, on the wall here. There's a, um, that, I forget what you call that. Sampler? Oh, the sampler. sampler, yeah, that's quite a thing you were telling me about. Right, uh, it's a sampler that my grandmother, who I did not know, she passed away before I was born, uh, made. And it goes back to Leonard Drown, who came over here about 1660 or so on a separate uh, ship uh, at the time. And it, it takes down his family. He had three sons, well, there was not three sons. He had many children, but he had one son by the name of Solomon Drown. And Solomon had a second son by the name, well, had a son by the name of Solomon. And Solomon had another son by the name of Solomon. <laughs> And then it goes on down through uh, Henry Drown and George Drown and so forth. But the, uh, the first Solomon that he uh, had, Henry's uh, son, his brother was Shem Drown, the person who made the weather vanes and who was, was famous for his weather vanes. Yeah. Um, there's also a story about Shem Drown, a short story that uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote. Um, it's called The Drown Image. Really? And, and then um, his, that Solomon Drown, his grandson was Dr. Solomon Drown, who was a surgeon uh, during the Revolutionary War. Okay. And Dr. Solomon Drown actually married an Elizabeth Russell who lived in Holliston, and they married in 1777 in Holliston, Mass. Did they stay here or? They, no, they moved on. He, he lived in near Boston and he served in the, uh, in the service. He became uh, close friends with Lafayette and Rochambeau, the two couple of the generals from France. Really? Yeah. And he went back and traveled to France and spent time over there. Um, very smart man. He uh, had three college degrees. His, uh, his, grad his undergraduate degree was from Brown, which was not called Brown University at the time. He got his master's from Dartmouth, and he got his doctorate in medicine from the University of Penn. Wow. Um, and he came back from England. He spent time in Rhode Island. He went out into Marietta, Ohio, where a lot of Revolutionary War people settled. Oh, really? And then he came back and spent time in Rhode Island, and he has a homestead which is on the National Registry in Foster, Rhode Island. Oh. 
um, and his, he's got uh, uh, in Foster, Rhode Island. There are a lot of uh, his family that's buried in, in Foster, Rhode Island. Oh, that's great. Wow, it's. I'm sure you could talk for hours on this subject. <laughs> I well, I enjoy it, and and Paul, it gives me a feeling of connection back to to American history. To know that people in my family survived, which many of them did not survive. Mm -hmm. um, many of them had. Uh, uh, multiple children that passed away. Some of them, it was very common for the families to have 12, 13 children, which was unheard, would be unheard of today. Um, but to know that these people fought for our freedom. Yeah, sure. They uh, not only survived, but they contributed to what America is today. Right. And someone like John Simmons with the clothing and with Simmons College, he was very much in charge of, in favor of education. I was always, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Uh -huh. um, my wife and her family, she was the first one to go to college in her family. I had two older sisters that did not go to school, and education was very important. And to have someone like John Simmons back uh, in the late 1800s feel the same way for women. Um, and I think you told me earlier that uh, Joanne is uh, related back to the Mayflower. Yes, my wife Joanne is related back to the Mayflower, to William Bradford, and I think it's Richard Warren was the oh. other family that she's related to. It's amazing that both of you end up uh, related back. Right, I think we But you're married now, you're also cousins kiss somewhere. Kissing cousins someplace. Yeah. <laughs> I, these family trees, I think, are family bushes now, and they, <laughs> they spread very rapidly. Wow, that's great. Well, thanks for ta taking the time to talk to us. It's been really enlightening for us. And I'm sure it will be for our viewers as well. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. There are many more Holliston residents descended from the Plymouth Colony. If we missed you, the Historical Society is hoping to get all the Mayflower cousins together for a reunion at the Asa Whiting House as soon as the COVID-19 pandemic is under control. So stay tuned to HCAT and the Holliston Historical Society websites for information about the event and more episodes of Holliston People and Places. A search on Facebook for Mayflower descendants will lead you to a wealth of information and groups to help you learn more about the pilgrims and your connection to them. Thanks for watching. <laughs>